What's good, y'all? It's your boy Brandon with Bama Fitness. And today we have someone super inspiring, especially to me when I was younger. I used to always look up to this guy and I used to look at him and be like, wow, this guy is a freaking beast. I, want, I need to be just like him when I grow up. And today we are actually good friends and his name is Sensei George Kataka. How are you? Doing good, Brandon. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me, man. It's uh, it's it's a definitely great opportunity. Thank you for giving me this uh, this chance to to do this with you. Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate it. It's a blessing to have you on the channel. Uh, Sensei George, can you explain how you got into karate and where you're at, like now, like teaching and everything? Yeah, for sure. Um, I started when I was three years old. Um, and um. Basically, my father was the one who pretty much introduced me to karate. He's a first generation Japanese, came to, um, to Honolulu uh, in 1965. And then one year later established a school. And um, when I was at that age, um, I probably don't even remember, you know, being three years old and going to the dojo, but my mm -hmm. mom and dad always used to tell me, they would just drag me along to the dojo and just kind of participate, you know, whether it's like five or 10 minutes, run around, play around, mm -hmm. and then just bringing me to class week after week, you know, and not really putting it on me too hard. And mm -hmm. I think just that was a nice way to introduce me because I got to see a lot of older kids, other people that you can interact with. And then after a while, I started to take it a little bit more seriously. And now I would actually go to some classes, you mm -hmm. know, do an hour class, whatever. And so they introduced it to me in kind of a nice way, an easy way, so that I kind of fell in love with it. And then once I started to pick it up, I just knew that it was something that um, I was kind of good at. I had some talent. I could learn things pretty quickly and started doing a little bit of competition. I started doing really well. So I kind of knew that it was kind of in my blood, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so throughout the years, I've just uh, been ultra competitive, um, you know, won some really nice titles along the way. But right now, after being retired, um, my main focus is just really giving back, giving back to my students, giving back to my dojo, um, doing seminars, um, you know, worldwide, uh, whatever I can do to make sure that the next generation that comes after me is in a better place. You know what I mean? Sure. So um, that's definitely my, um, that's my passion right now, for sure. That's awesome. I always talk about with others, you know, how we could motivate our future and our, our youth. Because that's super important nowadays, you know, uh, especially how the world is now. Mm -hmm. it, it's pretty crazy. So just motivating them to, you know, continue uh, with karate is like super important. So exactly, you know, yeah. you know, my one of my mentors, Sensei John Limkako, always told me that, um, you know, he was my mentor and he was like my father's, like one of his best students at the time, you know, and mm -hmm. he always told me when he was teaching me that he wanted me to be better than him. You know, um, mm -hmm. when you get to the very top, I don't want you to be as good as me. I want you to be better than me. And, and that's the, that's a really great philosophy because you always want the next generation or the people that are coming after you to be better than you. You don't want it to be worse or, you know, you don't want mm -hmm. it to be stagnant. You want to keep sure. growing and pushing the envelope. So um, for sure. That's that that really stuck with me, you know, when I was small, and that's why I do it to this day. Now, what what style do you do? Our style is called shitoryu, and then specifically it would be um, kotakaha shitoryu. My father has his kind of his own brand of shitoryu uh, karate. Yes. Oh, that's good stuff. I know a lot of people in the karate world. They usually stick to you know kata or like kumite. Do you also, do you do kumite, kata, kabuto? Uh, well, our school has always been just um, since the very, very beginning, very, um, I, I wouldn't want to say well-rounded, but we, we cover kata, mm -hmm. kumite, and kabuto, and all three aspects are pushed to our, to our you know, our student base, and that's uh, kind of like our curriculum. So obviously, you know, certain people may gravitate towards kumite or kata mm -hmm. just because of you know, you, you, the way you are brought up or the way you, you, your body likes it and the way you feel your characteristics. But um, we are a school that we really, really pride ourselves on teaching the different aspects, you know, kata and kumite. And then in addition to that, we do koboro. So um, I think we've been like that pretty much since, since I was, you know, a little kid. So um, I think what happens is 
is because karate is such a big time sport now where it's becoming, you know, it's going into the Olympics and then you have mm -hmm. the WKF, um, you become a lot more specialized. So you see athletes that are just going to focus solely on kata or solely on kumite. And that traditional aspect of trying to do both or learning all aspects of karate is kind of lost nowadays. But yeah. that's what happens when you when you transition from like a martial art to more of a sports specific, uh, mm -hmm. you know, avenue. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's cool. It's cool to do that. But, you know, like, like you said, like, I think being versatile and being like knowing, you know, especially not a lot of people do Kabuto, but knowing kabuto it can actually help you know your kata and kumite all of it works together in one um For sure especially like um with like shotokan you know like there's a lot of katas where we're doing like moves where we're actually like holding the bow um so it actually helps you know knowing uh kabuto knowing how to use uh the bow staff and and whatnot so yeah. yeah, I mean, there's even there's even senseis that I've talked to um, that have even said that even before kata was created, there was actually kobudo even before kata. Because if you think about mm -hmm. it in combat, you don't go to combat with bare fists. You go to combat mm -hmm. with weapons, right? Yep. Like you, you don't, after all of that gets stripped away, then mm -hmm. you're hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah. So there's a lot of... Um, theories that believe that possibly Koburo actually or Koburo katas came before even the actual katas that we practice predominantly today. So, you know, I don't know if that's a hundred percent fact, but there's a little bit of philosophy and, you know, ideology behind yeah. that kind of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Now, a lot of people, they, let's say they went up to YouTube and Googled your name or, you know, uh, put your name in a search engine, you would come up doing Kumite. Now, yes. did you do a lot of kata, um, like for yourself as well, like back in the day and like tournament? Yeah. So, um, pretty much we were told as a, as a, as a kid, even from nationals, we had to do kata, koburo and kumite, whether you liked it or not, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You, yeah. you have to try to show that you're well-rounded and that was our philosophy from the mm -hmm. get-go. And then, um, you know, like nowadays, it becomes a little bit more specific. So um, what's hard is when you do all three or all two, and then you go against a competitor who only specifically works on Kumite, you're at a somewhat of a disadvantage in the sense that that person is spending that much more time um, on Kumite than mm -hmm. when you're actually doing Kata, Kumite, Koboro, you know, you, yeah. you only have so many hours in a day. So um, sure. To a certain degree, you can you can start to see that gap pull away a little bit more mm -hmm. and more, you know. But some kids are some students are able to to manage that gap because they're very talented and yeah. they're able to put in just enough work in where they can really compete. But nowadays, just the way the avenue is going with Olympic karate, um, you have to start to become a little bit more specialized if you want to go that route, you know. Yes. yes. No, definitely. Now, what what would be your favorite kata kumite or kobudo? Yeah, my favorite is uh, Kumite. You know, mm -hmm. I've always liked the interaction, the battle between somebody else. There's something very um, instinctive about that, um, about trying to test your skills of, of, against another opponent. You know, Kata, mm -hmm. I do enjoy, and I have actually have a much bigger appreci appreciation for Kata now. I study mm -hmm. a lot more Kata now than Kumite just because I'm retired and I want to understand like how body mechanics and mm -hmm. um, just to, just more dwell into kata. Um, not to say that I know everything about kumite, but mm -hmm. um, kumite has come a lot more naturally for me. So that's yeah. why I kind of fell into that realm more. And now that I'm retired and I don't compete as much, I'm just um, trying to go back more to the roots and figure mm -hmm. out, you know, more about kata. So kata really interests me now. And yeah. I've changed the way I've taught um, since like, even from three to five years ago, I teach differently the mm -hmm. way I approach kata now. Um, but I've always been, my first love is kumite for sure. That's what I'm known for. Um, yeah. But um, I'll, I'll do everything. I'll do definitely do everything. What has been like the most like epic fight that you've been in? But one, 
that I do definitely remember was um, it was more of a redemption fight because uh, it was uh, back in uh, 2002 WKF uh, World Championships. And uh, this was in uh, uh, Madrid, Spain. Okay. And the, two years before, two years before, I lost to this guy from, from Spain. Mm-hmm. His name is Angel uh, Madero. And I believe I lost to him in like the um, quarterfinals. Mm-hmm. And uh, if I won that match, I would have went into the semifinals. Uh, so that year in 2000, I ended up winning a bronze. And then 2002, again, I think it was the quarterfinals again. But this time it was in his hometown. It was in, it was in Spain, you know. Mm. And I was just thinking to myself, like, this is my, this is my chance to, to upset him and then get into the semifinals and go all the way. Mm-hmm. And it was definitely a close match. And, and, I, and I finally pulled it off, you know. And that in my head, like with everybody in the crowd cheering against me, or the majority of the crowd was, yeah. you know, from Spain. So just, I just used all of that, 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 that feeling um, mm-hmm. and just try to pull everything out of my, my spirit, you know. And um, coming off of that win, that just made me feel like I was unstoppable. Because if I could do it in his own home country, Mm-hmm. You know, the semifinals and the finals, I was just, it's, it's, it's for me, for, for me that, you know, to take, you know what I mean? So yeah. that was a, that was a really special moment for me. Yes. That's good stuff. Is, can you tell everyone what your like workout regimen is? Cause I know if you if, guys, if you haven't seen Sensei George, he is ripped, <laughs> no, no, always, no. always working out. If you see his plyos, <laughs> they're insane. Like his workouts are like, actually really amazing. I, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I do steal them. So so, but yeah, what's your workout regimen? What does it consist of? Um, well, towards the end of my, you know, I mean, it, it changes. I mean, I haven't competed in a while, but, mm-hmm. you know, pretty much leading up to my, my competition days, like three months out, um, a minimum three months out, you're looking at um, training six days a week, maybe one day off, like on a Sunday or like on a Wednesday, just depending on my, how my body feels. But Towards the end of my career, I didn't put as much hours as I was when I was like in my early 20s, my mid 20s, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I really believe that when you're fine tuning your skills, especially when you're younger, you spend three, four hours, maybe even five hours a day drilling techniques, working on your mm-hmm. timing, your skills, your distancing, all of that, all of that. But um, towards my last year of competition, um, really, I mean, still was training every day, but I would spend like maybe an hour of training in the morning and mm-hmm. at night, another session of hours. So like two hours tops, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it was really like just fine tuning, fine tuning my timing, my skills, and just making sure that everything was just perfect. Everything, when I would throw a technique, it was just a perfect timing distance. So it was just really just, mm-hmm. just like polishing up the sword just to make sure it cuts perfectly, you know? Um, but what I would do is I was train, like I said, two sessions a day, mm-hmm. uh, maybe have a Sunday off. And then um, my actual personal training, my physical you know, conditioning would be like maybe like two to three times a week. Um, okay. So on the days that I would have like our personal training, I would just have one karate session, you know, so one karate session okay. in the morning and one personal training session. So that would equal to two. And mm-hmm. then I would just, you know, whatever. So um, I found that. For me, for me personally, that was uh, was a good regimen for myself. Yes. Did you do a lot of like explosive movements, like you know, like clean, clean and jerk, and cleans and, and all that cleans. jerks and all that stuff, or no? Um, I know that the athletes nowadays definitely are doing a lot of more Olympic lifts. I mean, mm-hmm. I see it all the time now Same. with people that I follow on Instagram, um, and there's a lot of truth to that. But a lot mm-hmm. of my plyos were a lot of sprints, going to the okay. track, or even in the dojo doing a lot of sprints, bounding, plyometrics, mm-hmm. just box jumps, um, jumping over hurdles. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I wasn't doing, I was definitely doing a lot of weight training, but that was very specified because, um, you know, it depends on how heavy you go too, right? Like you don't mm-hmm. want to be squatting 315 pounds, yeah. three plates, and that's like one month out. You need to be yeah. going a lot lower reps, mm-hmm. higher repetition, and doing explosive work instead of just building mass, building mass, strength, yeah. you know, there's a time yeah. and place for all of that. So finding the right regimen or the workout program is, is very essential. And everybody's body is a little different. You may be mm-hmm. at a certain peak 
you may to need to build a little more muscle just because you need to go up in weight. Yeah. So, but um, plyometrics, um, and then also what I found was really important. My personal tra uh, trainer, his name was Kenny Patton. Um, he had a karate background too, but he would make me do things where, for the whole three minutes, mm -hmm. the the entire three minute match, he would have me doing certain kind of things, exercises. So not just doing bench press, you know. Um, you know, maybe like, like, you know, whatever for how mm -hmm. many sets, I mean, he would be making me doing plyos, sprints, all these kind of routines, and then trying to stretch all of that out within a three minute mark and then mm -hmm. resting for one or two minutes and then coming back on and doing the same routine back again. And he would try to build that up to the point where I can go like six to seven rounds with mm -hmm. maybe only like two minutes of rest between each round so that my cardio, my cardiovascular yeah. would hit really hard and then I would only have two minutes to kind of recover and then mm -hmm. he would make me go back and do the same cycle so your your body gets um conditioned to go for those three minutes you know it's very specific yeah yeah, yeah. no that's good I need that I need to build my <laughs> cardiovascular I hate I hate running I hate it I hate it you know especially on my I, knees running outside and everything you know even for myself with my body type, I always hated running too. Like I was never good in long distance, but what I would do where say if I go for like a two mile or a three mile run, um, what I would do is like for the first mile or first mile and a half, I would just go at a very nice pace, just nothing too mm -hmm. hard. And then when I'll come back, um, just the way my house was in relation to where I was running from, I would just sprint the light post to light post. I would sprint and then mm -hmm. every other, I would just kind of really light jog, catch my breath, and then light post to light post, I would just sprint super hard. Mm -hmm. So just kind of getting that heart rate super high, like if yeah. you're just going through a whole bunch of, you know, exercise, um, like like a blitzing routine, blitzing. and then yep. you just bring the heart rate back down to something where you're kind of managing, and then you hit it back up again. So then it was kind of like the best of both worlds where you're still hitting that long cardio kind of workout, yeah. but you're really getting your heart rate up, you know? Good. I'm going to have to do something, something like that. that. Yeah, I'm going to do something like that. So I remember a long time ago, I used to see photos of you um, doing jujitsu. Do you still do jujitsu? So due to the, to the pandemic, I haven't done any jujitsu. No. But, you know, since I was, um, I can think of like a junior in high school, um, I had a really good friend. Um, I mean, still my, actually my best friend, but he was... Um, taking Gracie Jiu Jitsu, um, mm -hmm. Helsing Gracie um, was living in Hawaii since like the, um, I think like the early to mid eighties. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who introduced Gracie Jiu Jitsu to Hawaii. And my friend, since he was an intermediate, started to take, you know, lessons from Helsing Gracie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now he's a black belt. He has his own dojo, which is still under Helsing Gracie. But um, I started doing that in like my junior year and just doing it like once a week, maybe like twice a week at the most. And then um, just trying to balance, you know, my karate with my jujitsu. It was very difficult, especially when I got into my twenties, when I was very competitive, I was trying to make the WKF circuit, trying mm -hmm. to compete at that level. So, you know, maybe on my, my days off or like during the summer or like the winter time when there's a seasons kind of off, yeah. I'll go back into training jujitsu. So I've never been really consistent with it, but gotcha. um you know, there's been stretches where I have put some good amount of classes together, but I do love it uh, tremendously. I think that it's, uh, you know, I do miss it a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. with karate right now, like I'm an instructor, I'm a teacher. So it's a lot different because, you know, when I'm at jujitsu, I'm a student, you know, like yeah. uh, I like being a student. I like not being able to talk, you know, bark orders, tell people yeah. what to do. I like being the student learning, mm -hmm. you know, and just absorbing as much information. And for me, jujitsu doesn't come naturally. Karate, you know, Natural. is just second nature, yeah. like the back of yeah. my hand. Jujitsu, um, it takes me a while. And that's why, like, I love it too. It doesn't come that easy. So I got to put a lot more effort, a lot more yeah. reps, a lot more, you know, focus up here. And it pushes me in a way, you know, um, I don't think I would appreciate it if I, it was too easy for me, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So, but definitely I'll, you know, once this pandemic, hopefully things will get better. I'll get myself back in the, um, the dojo. Yeah, definitely. Uh, when I was in Albany, um, at times, you know, I would go with my friend to, um, uh, our friends, uh, jujitsu school. Uh, we have a friend out there, Bruno, and he, uh, 
he has his own jujitsu school and just just being in it you know doing class it's cool but it's so different from you know training you know karate or a specific style and just going sure. here and just like grappling and everything it takes a lot out of you man it definitely does but it's a great workout it is a great yeah workout. like uh you know i would remember being in really good shape for karate mm -hmm. and then you know at the end of the class you, you always get to roll it's like free sparring you know yeah and when i first started jujitsu like i could not understand like i was in such a good karate shape but i would roll like two three minutes and i would be spent oh, yeah. and then you know <laughs> the timer goes off and you have like like you know 30 seconds to get another partner i was like mm -hmm. you know oh no no <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's like, too much and it took it, it took me a while to mm -hmm. really you know get into that kind of jujitsu you know kind of wrestling cardio shape mm -hmm. for for me to do multiple multiple rounds you know it's a different yeah. kind of workout so yeah, um it is it, it's 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 that's workout. why i love it too you know what i mean just just yeah. because you think you're in good shape in karate don't mean you know it's exactly. you're always it's different you know yeah you're it's different for definitely sure. different definitely yeah like in high school uh have you done other sports such as like football or was it always karate you know i tried track um because i thought i was fast <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I thought it was pretty quick and you know um but uh i did like the 400 and i think i went out to two meets and i ended up getting like out of the eight people ended up being like six both times <laughs> it, made, it, made, it made me feel really yes. slow and insecure <laughs> maybe this isn't for me yeah so but the track workouts were awesome they really mm -hmm. pushed me um there's you, you you there's a lot of value in track workouts and sprint yeah. work um that you can definitely incorporate into karate for sure mm -hmm. um but so afterwards i was just like also defeated and then what really actually pulled me away from track was that I was so tired, you know, training track for like two hours. And then I would have to go to the dojo and put in another two more hours. So yeah. I noticed like my performance in karate was just going down. Cause like overall my energy levels were just like shot, you know, mm -hmm. even though mentally I wanted to push like physically, I couldn't go. So like, I got to a point where it's like, you know, I gotta make a choice, you know, yeah. um, but there's a lot of other people out there who, who can multitask. And I wasn't mm -hmm. the type of person who could do, basketball soccer football and then do something else you know and there's a yeah. lot of athletes a lot of kids who can do it because you know maybe from a little time they've been always doing it so they're conditioned to do that but yeah. i've always been like a kind of like a one sport type of person you know um yeah um, same here just lucky yeah you know yeah no same here i i grew up doing you know i did track it was cool it wasn't i knew it wasn't me i did football for mm. like two years three years it really wasn't me Mm -hmm. Then I broke my ankle in football. Oh man! Then you know I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna stick with karate. You know, this is <laughs> karate is more me. You know, I feel more at home doing karate. If people knew me as, oh Brandon, he's a karate kid. You know, that's that's the karate man right there. You know, so I'm like, you know, what? Mm -hmm. karate is me. So I'm gonna stick with karate. So, yeah. Yeah, everybody's everybody's a little different. Everybody has their own path. Everybody has their own avenue. You know, so um mm -hmm. like i said i was just more of a one one sport athlete and i, I kind of knew you know back yeah. in the day like when i first started like this is my love and this is what i mm -hmm. you know i'm pretty good at you know i even tried like baseball when i was little and mm -hmm. that just went south real quick yeah. you know what i mean uh just uh <laughs> yes, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah i don't blame you how did you know you wanted to retire yeah that's a really good question so i won my first world title in 2002 um and what I wanted to do was repeat in 2004. Mm -hmm. And I think I put a lot of pressure on, pressure on my shoulders to do that. And then I ended up losing like in the third round, just before maybe the quarterfinals or something. And uh, was it, it, it didn't settle with me too well, you know? I wanted mm -hmm. to go out on top, you know, back to back kind of thing. So I decided that 2006, I'm just gonna give it one more shot, you know? and. Mm -hmm. 2006, I believe was in Finland. So trained really hard, you know, wanted to go out on top again, or at least hit the metal stand, you know, do well. And again, uh, 
I forgot where I lost, maybe quarterfinals again. Mm -hmm. So after 2006, I really thought I was going to retire, you know, and, um, but in the back of my head, I've always thought like, is this the way you want to go out? You know, is that how you want to remember, you know, your last match was a loss. Mm -hmm. So I had to really, you know, dig really, really deep. There was about a good year where I was just kind of going through the motions, still training really hard, mm -hmm. but mentally not there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Training super hard, but back of my head, I'm just like, you know what? You're, you're probably, you, you got your title that you wanted. Mm -hmm. You should be happy and just be happy with that. But then something behind just kept telling me, you know, you got to make one more run, one more run. And I do remember specifically um, one day um, that I was just in the morning, got up, still kind of pondering this whole thing. And I was, I was in the shower and then the shower is just kind of hitting me. You know, I'm just mm -hmm. thinking to myself, what am I going to do? And I just started to feel like, you know, you've been, you know, pitting yourself this whole time you're making excuses mm -hmm. make a decision right now whether you're going to retire or not stop you know being in limbo yeah. and right at that moment i said i'm going to do 2008 tokyo to 2008 tokyo will be my last hurrah whatever win lose mm -hmm. or draw whatever i'm going to go and then since that day it, i was just so determined like went to the dojo still worked really hard but my mindset was just so much more like no, this is why yeah. you're going to do it, it, you know? So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, luckily 2008, you know, got that second world title. Um, nice. But I definitely, even if I lost in 2008, I would have been done. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, it was just, uh, that's when I really, really knew. It. And it was just good that I won so that I was able to, to go out mm -hmm. on top. You know, it was really, awesome. really a blessing, really blessing. Yeah. yeah. Would you say 2002 and 2008, would be like one of your greatest like karate like achievements for sure yeah uh yeah. definitely you know 2002 was awesome because that was the first time i did it but 2008 mm -hmm. was i don't know if it's more special but it's 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 kind of more meaningful in the sense that um my father got to watch me win it mm -hmm. because in 2002 he wasn't there okay. um, you know in 2008 it's um kind of back in Japan, it's in Tokyo. Yeah. There's a mm -hmm. lot of family. There's a lot of my dad's old school friends coming to watch. So yeah, it was really nice for my dad to finally see me win and in front of like family. So it, it was mm -hmm. a little more meaningful in that sense, you know? Um, yeah. But the first one has a lot of value just because it's my first title, you know? Um, so they Good both stuff. mean a lot to me, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Especially like, like you said, like when your father's there and all your, like friends and family and everything are there to watch you, you know, it pumps you up even more. Like, exactly. You know, doing this for family, you know, doing this for friends and doing it for, for yourself, sure. of course. And especially that being your last year and making it happen. That is good stuff for you, man. That's awesome. Right on, man. That's yeah. awesome. A lot of people say it's hard to make a living just doing karate. And a lot of people sacrifice uh, having a regular job um, when training, cause you know, a lot of, you can't take a lot of time off when you have a regular job to travel and compete and everything. Now is all you do, you know, do you just teach or do you have a, another job on top of that? So, um, yeah, karate is my full-time profession. This is, there's no, there's no backup plan for me. There's no plan okay. B. Um, but within the teaching aspect, I'll do things like you know, seminars. So there's, mm -hmm. there's extra income that's coming in, you know, whether now it's on zoom yeah. or before you'd actually travel, go to different places to teach and so forth. Um, I would do, I have my own, um, website where I have a subscription based kind of thing where you can learn all of my techniques and my drills. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's also another type of residual income that comes in, um, okay. with me not doing anything, you know, as long mm -hmm. as there's subscriptions, people wanting to there's money coming in. So there's other avenues of Good. making money through karate just besides not teaching and so forth. And I've, um, I've tried to do that. Um, mm -hmm. and, it, and it is a little difficult because I think like if you want to do martial arts as a full time, the money where the money comes is, is your student base. I mean, if you only yeah. have 20, 25 students, you're not going to make a lot of money. You need, mm -hmm. you need a dojo that can have 75 to 100 or even more students, um, you know, and that's mm -hmm. where you start to bring in a little bit more money and so forth. So it takes a lot of time because 
it takes a while to build up that base, right? Like mm-hmm. you can open, you know, if you have like in a regular, uh, regular company, if you have a really great product, you can grow really fast. But even with Karate, it takes a while to get 20 students in 30, yeah. 40. Then once you get there, it's nice, but mm-hmm. to get to that point takes a lot of years, you know, two Definitely. to three, maybe even five years, you know, um, just yeah. depending on your demographics, your, how you're marketing yourself, how good you're teaching and so forth. So, um, it's, it's a long-term, it's a long haul kind of thing, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely not short-term. Will you ever come out of retirement and probably do one more competition? You know, that's a really funny question because not a funny question. That's a good question. But everybody who's asked me that since I retired in, you know, 2008, I've told them no, you know, like mm-hmm. I'm totally done. And that feeling of competing has left me, you know, and mm-hmm. I still love watching people compete. You know, I, I, I try to enjoy like the new generation, you know, I, you know, and like I told you, like, I love giving back by teaching and inspiring others. And then just recently, like I thought about my mentor, Sensei John, and mm-hmm. then my father holds this tournament called the All Hoi. Um, and I forgot how many years ago, maybe five, six years, I, I, maybe even a little further back than that he did like the senior division. Okay. And he's my Mm -hmm. mentor and, and he hasn't competed in years. And I think he just turned like 50 or something. So Uh just, um, because on his 50th, you know, his 50th birthday, whatever he came back and he did, um, like the 35 and over division or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. and it was really inspirational, you know, like since John's super ultra competitive and I would never have thought he would ever do something like that. But I guess for that moment, you know, turning 50 and mm-hmm. just inspiring his students. Um, he did it and he looked amazing, you know? Um, yeah. So I always thought about like, you know, what if I did something like that? You know, I'm, I'm not saying I would, but like mm-hmm. that was kind of cool for him to do. And for the, all these little kids and the next generation to see what he was really made out of, you know, um, obviously sure. you probably don't move as fast and, you know, but just the act of doing you know, how does that inspire other people? So I would never probably come back on a big scale, but mm-hmm. maybe a, a big, maybe I might do something on a small scale, like what he did, you know, yeah. um, just to kind of, you know, get everybody in the dojo riled up and like, just, just getting the energy up, you know? So mm-hmm. it's a definitely, um, it, it's an option, but I, I don't know yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't even, don't even tell anybody, just come out with your knee and just stand by. I say, what you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> I'm yeah. competing. No way. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll, be, that'll be funny. Just do everything underground. Just do all my training, like on the yep. side and just, just one day just, just show up. <laughs> no, that'd be crazy. That'd be crazy. That, that'd be good stuff. I remember when I moved out to California the first time, um, I was in Sacramento, but outside of Sacramento, like in Davis area. And uh, I was training with Sensei, uh, Sensei John Okaku. And oh my gosh, it wasn't for long. But let me tell you, within that month, my kumite, I thought it was good. My kumite (laughs) went from here to, like, (laughs) dude is so amazing. Like, he, man, I can't even, I can't even explain it. Sensei John, super inspirational, super intelligent, super knowledgeable. Like, he, he changed the way I saw Kumite. Kata, too. So grateful for him. I'm glad that I had a chance to, you know, uh, work to with be him, yeah. training and work with him. Yeah, he's super great. Super great. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a definitely, um, he's, you know, my, my, my mentor, you know, the one and only mentor uh, besides my father that really grew me. And he's everything from, he's lead by example. I mean, he talks the talk, he walks the walk. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know anybody else who's more passionate, you know, about teaching and karate than anybody. He's, uh, you know, sometimes he goes a little too much, you know, but but at the end of the day, you know, it's coming from a really good place. You know, it might sometimes rub you the wrong way, Mm -hmm. but Sensei John, Sensei John's heart is pure. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's as pure as it gets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when you really get to know him, you'll understand like, He only means, he only wants 110%. He probably wants it more for you than than you realize yourself. Your own potential, you don't realize it, but he knows that you can really do it. And that's why he pushes you so hard, you know? Definitely, definitely. I can definitely see that. Now, what motivates you? What motivates me? um, 
is just trying to to make sure that when I'm done, that I left this place in a better place, and mm -hmm. that I've really uh, inspired other people to be to reach their full potential. You know, um, mm -hmm. I really do find a reward in taking some random kid that didn't ever think that he would ever do karate or last, you know, how many days in the dojo, but seeing that growth and then being there for them during their highs, their lows, whether it's competition, or whether they're, mm -hmm. they're not even in competition, but being there for them and letting them know that people care. There's somebody out there that cares about you. You know, I want to make sure to leave a legacy then know that students will say like, Man, Sit George really took care of me. To, you know, mm -hmm. he was an inspiration. Everything was um was lead by example, you know. So yeah. that's what I want to do. And you know, that's my inspiration. And then the second inspiration, besides that, um, obviously is my is my children, my two girls, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure uh, that they're taken care of. Um, and that that keeps me going every single day, knowing that when I come home from a hard day of work at the dojo and you know, mm -hmm. students are not listening and I'm having a hard day and I come mm -hmm. home and they're like, daddy, daddy. Yeah. And they give you that hug and I love mm -hmm. you or we missed you. That makes it all worth it. You know what I'm saying? So For sure. um, I'll spend the rest of my life just um, trying to be the best dad as I can. So my girls are my definitely my inspiration. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. What is your favorite type of music to listen to? Hip hop. <laughs> Hip hop. Yeah. All right. Give me a, give me one artist. If you can name one artist. Boom. I know well, I'll give, you, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you my favorite solo, Tupac, and for sure. Tribe Called Quest is uh, oh, my yeah. favorite group. Group, you know. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of people who I who I who I like, but Tupac mm -hmm. um is one of my favorite hip hop. I mean, is my favorite hip hop, favorite. you know, artist. And then awesome. a tribe called Quest is 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 I love Tribe Called Quest. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Tribe Called Quest is, is is dope. I like Tribe Called Quest. What is your favorite movie? My favorite movie. Hmm. I would say probably Braveheart. <laughs> Braveheart. Great movie. Great movie. Yeah. So. Great movie. You Man. know, there's something that kind of strikes a chord and just uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Mel Gibson and just yeah. what that meant. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. That's one movie, definitely. I kind of like those kind of movies, you know? Yeah. You know, those kind of gladiator kind of feeling kind of yeah. movie. But uh, the Brave Fart for sure. Yeah. Awesome. And my last question for you, what advice can you give to the upcoming uh, athletes, our youth? Yeah, the, the best advice I could give is, first and foremost, I always tell my students and everybody who I talk to is, you got to have... Um, you got to set goals in life, you know, mm -hmm. short-term goals, and then eventually having long, long-term goals. And I remember as a little kid, I've always ha had a dream about being the best, whatever that meant at the time, you know, whether it was being the best in, in your state tournament or nationals, whatever, always believe that I wanted to be the best, you know? Mm -hmm. So kids um, need to have that kind of inspiration or is whatever is a dream or, you know, a goal they need to, constantly have those and short-term goals are good in the sense that whether it's just jumping higher or getting mm -hmm. that next win or you know doing a little better in your kata division or whatever keep hitting those goals making goals for yourself and then before you know it if you look two three years down the line you have a track record of success you may yeah. not have be become the national champion but you're on your way to to success Mm -hmm. um, second thing is surround yourself with really good people because the people who you surround yourself with have a huge, huge influence. If you're mm -hmm. around the wrong type of people, they're probably going to do some bad things. You know what I mean? For sure. Or, or negativity is going to weigh you down. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. having a good support system is tremendous. You know, um, you know, that's, that's important. And that's why a dojo is a good thing. Cause for the most part, the dojo is a safe haven. It's a place where you can sure. just release all your stress. You, you, you train hard. You have a good friendship with all your classmates or you, you, you build that relationship with your sensei. Mm -hmm. And um, most importantly, I think that everybody has got to understand that it's going to be hard. And For I know sure. it's not the message that most people want to hear, but 
life is going to be hard. And for my role to become a world champion, you know, I'm not saying that I, you know, I grew up in a, in a, in a rough neighborhood or a poor neighborhood. I, you know, I had a hard time making ends meet. I came from a very, um, you know, middle income kind of family. I pretty mm-hmm. much got the things that I wanted to have as far as like materialistic things, you know, but I've always been taught to work extremely hard and to really, if you want something in life, you got to go get it. So within this journey, whatever your goals in life are, you are going to have setbacks for sure. For sure. You will be yeah. pulled down. People will bring you down, whether you like it or not. You're going to find out who your real friends are, you know, are yeah. or not. And, Definitely. but the most important thing is to always get back up. Remember what those thoughts of having that dream were going back and thinking when I was a kid, I had a dream about being this great, you know, and mm-hmm. continuing to replay that in your head and continuing to pursue that dream, you yeah. know, no matter how how difficult things get because, you know, anything's able to be, you know, you can accomplish a lot of great things in life as long as the mindset is really strong and you persevere and you have determination. So that's for my, sure. that's my advice for the, for the up and coming. It's going to be awesome. hard, but continue, continue the path. For sure. You heard that kids make sure <laughs> don't give up whatever goals that you have, make sure you just go at them at a hundred percent. Cause if you don't, you may not get there. So give it all you got, even though you fail, Hey, there's always going to be bumps in the roads. You just got to overcome. And like Sensei said, you got to persevere. Sensei, I appreciate you uh, being on Get to Know Me. Thank you so much. And definitely, if you guys enjoyed this, make sure that you go follow Sensei George in the description below. Will be all of his links to his website and to his Instagram page. Make sure you guys go and follow and support. All right, Sensei, thank you again. I really appreciate you being on here. Thanks a lot, Brandon. Thanks so much for having me, man. Appreciate that. No problem, no problem. Everyone, I'll talk to you guys soon. Peace.